Thank you very much for the invitation. So unfortunately, when we talk about diabetic neuropathy, we do not have new agents that are uh, disease modifying, uh, but we do have some interesting new facts about diagnosis and about symptomatic treatment. So let's begin. Uh, I have no disclosures, and um, the outline of this uh, lecture is gonna be, uh, first of all, a brief uh, talk about diabetic neuropathy, and we'll concentrate on different forms of diabetic neuropathy, such as the classic distal symmetric polyneuropathy, the diabetic autonomic neuropathies, uh, diabetic amyotrophy, treatment-induced uh, neuropathy, that's what you guys, what endocrinologists do to, to patients, and then uh, mononeuropathies associated with diabetes. So half a billion people suffer from diabetes, and half of these at one point will develop a neuropathy. Um, there are many different types, as we mentioned, the classic one, the one that you encounter uh, many times in, in, in your clinics, which is the distal symmetric neuropathy, but you can also experience other types that we will be touching uh, or will be explaining uh, later on. So symptoms vary according to the type of nerve that is damaged. When you have sensory nerve damage, you'll have symptoms such as burning sensation, tingling, numbness, uh, sensory ataxia. When you have motor nerve damage, you will end up eventually having weakness, but initially you will have cramps and twitching. And when you have autonomic nervous system damage, you will have a variety of symptoms, including proximal hyperhidrosis, uh, impotence, early satiety, and orthostatic hypotension. Now, the classic form of neuropathy, which is a distal symmetric neuropathy, this is seen in 30% of patients with diabetes, more in type 2 than in type 1, and seen in young patients also in type 1. And the interesting thing, you can see it in pre-diabetes, not only in uh, diabetes. And you will have a combination of small fiber and large fiber symptoms. Now, let's look at how things present with uh, small fiber and with large fiber. If you go and look at large fiber symptoms, you will have either normal sensory no sensory loss or frank severe sensory loss. But in small fiber neuropathy, you do not necessarily have a huge sensory loss. It's either minimal or absent. Uh, pain is severe in both. Uh, tendon reflexes are, uh, can be absent over here, but can be minimally reduced in the small fiber category. And the motor deficit can be very large, can be from zero to extreme motor deficit in large fiber neuropathy, but can be absent in small fiber neuropathy. Now, what are the risk factors? Age is a risk factor. Disease duration is a risk factor. Race, actually African Americans have higher risk factors of developing the classic distal symmetric polyneuropathy. And presence of metabolic syndrome is another major risk factor, which is having three out of five elevated uh, fasting glucose, obesity, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, and low HDL. Now, how do you diagnose it? Um, it's mainly diagnosed through physical exam and clinical history. You do not need to do electrodiagnostic testing unless there are certain problems which we will be mentioning later on. So it depends on the patient's presentation. When do you do electrodiagnostic testing? You do the electrodiagnostic testing if you're having asymmetric symptoms. Asymmetric symptoms can be due, for example, to mononeuritis multiplex, can be due to a radiculopathy. So here you order electrodiagnostic test testing. If you have non-length dependent symptoms, if you have a motor predominance, diabetic neuropathy is not gonna present initially with a motor symptom. It will begin with sensory symptoms. Um, if you have an acute or a subacute sub onset, or if you have predominant autonomic involvement. Now, how do we manage these patients? As I told you, unfortunately, there is no disease modifying agent. Still, what we can do is do risk factor modification. And in type two diabetes, glycemic control and risk factor modification only with glycemic control will not benefit. You need to target metabolic syndrome. In type one diabetes, it will work. So in type two diabetes, you need to work on weight loss. And uh, weight loss has been shown to improve the nerve fiber density uh, when skin biopsies are done. The second thing is exercise. 
Exercise also has been shown to stabilize nerve fiber density loss in uh, patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, if we go and look at pain management uh, and uh, the American uh, Academy of Neurology guidelines, uh, new guidelines have been published in 2022, and they recommend using one of four uh, classes of medications, gabapentinoids, SNRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, and sodium channel blockers. The interesting thing is that if you go and look at the dosing, the dosing is really much higher than what we use in, in, in clinical practice over here in Bahrain. Um, for example, look at uh, amitriptyline. They, they start with 75 and they say that 75 to 150 is the recommended dose. Pharmacogenomics of patients that we have over here, if you give them 75, they will be asleep for an entire 24 hours. So uh, in our population, the dosing that is recommended by the American Academy of Neurology does not work. However, what's interesting is in order for us to judge if the medication is working or not, we need to look at the durations that are uh, recommended by the AAN. So for example, in amitriptyline, you need to wait for six weeks. You cannot say that the medication is not working if you do not wait for six weeks. Same thing is for, for example, duloxetine. Duloxetine is commonly used, but if you do not wait for 12 weeks, you cannot say that this medication is not working for your patient. Now, look at pregabalin and gabapentin. The dose is used for pregabalin is 300 to 600. If you write 600 here, NHRA will be running after you, asking you why are you giving such a huge or humongous dose for your patient. Um, can we use other classes of medications? Yes, the AAN uh, states that uh, in certain patients we can use uh, topical, non-traditional or non-pharmacological interventions such as capsaicin, for example. CBT and exercise also may be used. Now, you might ask, does combination therapy work? Yes. There is a recent trial published in Lancet. It's called the Options DM trial. The Options DM trial looked at com combining uh, amitriptyline with pregabalin in one arm, uh, pregabalin with amitriptyline in the other arm, vice versa, and then duloxetine and pregabalin, and found that all of these three combinations are uh, having the same efficacy, therefore, they all, nothing is superior to the other one. However, uh, in terms of side effects, there is a difference in side effects. Now, if we go to autonomic neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy is another important um, type of neuropathy that is uh, being seen in, in diabetes. And there are many different forms of diabetic autonomic neuropathy. This includes gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy, urogenital autonomic neuropathy, pseudomotor dysfunction, and cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. With uh, gastrointestinal autonomic neuropathy, you'll see things such as gastroparesis, constipation, and diarrhea. And in urogenital autonomic neuropathy, we'll see bladder dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. And this is seen both in females and males. Not only uh, does uh, sexual dysfunction due to diabetic autonomic neuropathy manifests as impotence in males, but uh, there has been, uh, there is data showing decreased release of nitric oxide leading to decreased vaginal relaxation and dyspareunia in females. Um, going into pseudomotor dysfunction, what happens in diabetes is that you start to have anhydrosis in a length-dependent fashion in both the feet and the hands. And loss of ability to sweat over here leads to excessive sweating proximally. So patients will not come stating that they have no sweating in their palms or their feet, but they will come complaining of excessive sweating proximally in their heads and in their uh, trunks. So how do we diagnose this problem? It's mainly a clinical diagnosis and uh, electrodiagnostic uh, tests such as the QSART can be done. Going into a very important uh, manifestation of, of, of diabetes, which is cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. When we think about cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, we think, we think about orthostatic hypotension. But believe it or not, orthostatic hypotension only occurs very late in the disease. Early on, what happens is that you have involvement of the parasympathetic nerves, and this leads to elevated heart rate and impaired heart rate variability. 
just late in the disease, what you'll see is orthostatic hypotension. Um, so the earliest symptoms that you'll encounter are dizziness and decreased exercise tolerance, and the late symptom will be orthostatic hypotension and syncope. Um, now, one uh, cohort was, was done and looked at how does diabetic cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy affect mortality. The relative risk of uh, diabetic autonomic neuropathy to lead to mortality is 3.17. And this means that patients with such, that, with, with such manifestation have a much higher risk of developing mortality. Um, how does it lead to mortality? It can lead to QT interval prolongation. It re leads to reduced awareness of myocardial ischemia, and it leads to diminished hemodynamic response in the setting of stressors such as infection or ischemia. How do we diagnose it? Um, there is a battery called the E-wing battery. The E-wing battery has uh, five different uh, sections. So the beat-to-beat -beat variation uh, in heart rate in response to deep breathing, the beat-to-beat -beat variation uh, in heart rate during the Valsalva maneuver, the heart rate response to standing, the systolic blood pressure response to standing, and the blood pressure response to isometric hand grip. When you have one abnormal uh, result here, it is uh, possible that you have a, a cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. If you have two abnormal results, then you have definite cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. And if you have orthostatic hypotension, then this means that you have severe uh, cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. Now, how do we manage that? First of all, prevention. Uh, and then we, lead, we go into non-pharmacological and into pharmacological uh, management. Now, with regards to non-pharmacological management, you try to increase uh, the intravascular volume. How do you do that? You do that by increasing fluid intake, by liberalizing salt, and by uh, considering waist-high compression stockings. You also uh, recommend that your patients modify their behavior by arising slowly, by elevating the head bed by 30 to 45 degrees, and avoiding triggers such as the Valsalva maneuver. How about pharmacological management? Four agents uh, can be used, fludrocortisone, midodrine, droxidopa, and pyridostigmine. Uh, going now into another form of diabetic neuropathy or another manifestation, which is diabetic amyotrophy or diabetic lumbosacral radiculoplexus neuropathy. This is really common in comparison to uh, disorders such as GBS, CIDP, and Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Uh, as we said earlier, half a billion of people have diabetes, and uh, diabetic amyotrophy will affect 0.3 of patients with type 1 diabetes and 1.1% of patients with type 2 diabetes. And when does it occur? It occurs in patients who have a relatively well-controlled uh, HbA1c of 7.5% and uh, in patients who have lost weight by 4.5 kilograms uh, or more. Now, what puts you at risk of developing diabetic amyotrophy? Uh, having a history of stroke, having a high BMI, and having comorbid uh, autoimmune disorders such as thyroiditis, myasthenia gravis, MS, IBD, and psoriasis. So when do we think of diabetic amyotrophy? We think of it in someone who has severe pain in one of the lower limbs that is acute to subacute and in the setting of recent weight loss and when we have an A1C of around 7.5% with some of these risk factors being present. Um, as I said, patients present with acute severe pain, with burning sensation. Later on, they develop focal limb weakness and muscle atrophy. Um, how do we diagnose? We diagnose by history, by physical exam, by electrodiagnostic testing. Um, we can consider doing uh, MRI and uh, MR neurography, uh, nerve biopsy if uh, we're totally unsure, and CSF uh, where we'll find high uh, protein. And how is it managed? Management is symptomatic. IV steroids can be considered early in the disease if we have uh, severe pain, but otherwise you should not uh, give IV steroids. Physiotherapy and occupational therapy are very important here. Now, going into the treatment-induced neuropathy of diabetes. So, if you correct a patient's HbA1c by two over three months, 
what happens is that you have a 20% risk of developing treatment-induced neuropathy. If you correct HbA1c by uh, around 4%, uh, what happens is that you will have an 80% of developing treatment-induced neuropathy. So fast correction of HbA1c can lead to uh, treatment-induced neuropathy, which presents with uh, both small fiber and large fiber symptoms. They will have uh, severe pain, they will have sensory loss, and they can have autonomic dysfunction. So we need to be really careful about uh, hypercorrection of, treat of, 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 of A1C in patients, and uh, we need to consider starting symptomatic management early on in these patients. Um, how do we diagnose it? We diagnose it through history. Uh, through uh, looking at, at A1C significant drops and through electrodiagnostic testing by nerve conduction studies and EMG. And how do we manage it? First of all, we try to prevent uh, leading to treatment-induced neuropathy and we manage pain as the American Academy of Neurology uh, uh, recommends, which is one of the four uh, classes of medications being the sodium channel blockers, the SNRIs, the gabapentinoids, and the uh, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, now, going to mononeuropathies associated with diabetes, um, carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, and uh, common fibular neuropathy uh, at the fibular head are much more common in patients with diabetes than uh, uh, seen in the general population. Uh, for carpal tunnel, we go and uh, give wrist splints, uh, corticosteroid injections locally, or surgical intervention in cases of severe cases. Um, for cubital tunnel syndrome, uh, lifestyle modification, corticosteroid injections, and uh, surgery uh, in more severe cases. And for common fibular neuropathy, uh, depends on uh, whether it is mild or severe. Surgery comes for severe cases, and mild cases recover by themselves. Uh, thank you very much.